Laura, thanks so much for joining us. Let me first ask you about Thank the you. U.S. situation. We talk about this, um, you know, every time you come on since Donald Trump came into office, but what is pricing pressure like there? On the one hand, you've got the president pushing for lower prices. On the other hand, it looks like they're doing everything they can to roll back Obamacare. So how's the environment? You can say the environment we compete in is one where there are multiple product choice, so there's competitiveness within the industry. And in some segments, that's driving down cost of, of medication for, for Americans, which I think is, is really, really good. Uh, the administration is trying to impose different price control mechanisms uh, lately uh, in part Medicare Part B. This is a segment where Nord Nordisk is, is not exposed. So right now, we actually see something that's overall stable for, for Nord Nordisk. Okay, so you're not exposed on the Part B Medicare question. Good morning to you, Lars. Can I ask you about Trump's other comments mm -hmm. around international drug pricing and trying to get to an index situation? This sounds quite radical. What would it mean for Novo Nordisk if the US said, we're not going to pay any more for your products than they'd pay in other developed markets? So it's important to break down the individual segments in the U.S. So what the administration is talking about is what government what government is paying for for drugs. And if you look in the Medicare Part D segment, in the Medicaid segment for for the poor and in veterans for for retired uh, military uh, people, there you actually see in in Medicare Part D that pricing is going down in some of these segments. So it's already a quite competitive uh, environment. Uh, I think it's different in Medicare Part B. And I also observed that some of the government uh, officials have been out saying that, you know, uh, focus now Medicare Part B. Early on this year, uh, they asked the industry to pay a larger part of the coverage gap. So uh, come 19, we'll see that we'll be impacted in the Medicare Part D. That's an old case. Uh, so I actually think the U.S. government is getting a actually quite attractive price for our products uh, in the U.S. market. How do you um, look at the competition that you have? I know uh, Eli Lilly um, just published their, their mid-stage results last month. Investors are an anxious that would affect your new class of diabetes drugs. How's the horse race coming along? So I think it's important to note that what drives value of a market is continued innovation. And I actually think it takes two strong companies to drive the value of a market. So I welcome innovation also from Eli Lilly. And, and if you look at the history in the GLP-1 segment, there's been a, a, a change in, 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 in products over time. And now we see that right now, Noronoisk is actually winning based on our latest innovation, Ozempic. And Lilly has now announced that they have some data that could potentially lead to that they, in some years, could have a, a strong product. So in the meantime, we are executing on our uh, product portfolio, so winning share with Oxempic. We have all semaglutide that we can launch uh, in a couple of years. And we, of course, all, also in our pipeline have uh, next generation opportunities where we, we believe we can match or even beat what Lilly is bringing forward. So this is a classical pharmaceutical uh, industry where there's continued innovation. And I think that's, that's positive that there are two companies aiming at uh, expanding the market and also driving thereby the value of the market for the benefit of patients who get better products. And of course, there's also commercial opportunity for those who succeed in that market. Lars, is gene therapy a space that Novo Nordisk wants to get involved with? And if not, how will your haemophilia portfolio perform? So we are not yet active in gene therapy. Uh, there are a lot of opportunities uh, taking place out there. What we are focusing on is actually stem cell-based therapy, uh, not particular in, in hemophilia, uh, but working with cells is something we know really, really well. So we are, we are investing significantly in, uh, in stem cell-based therapy. We have in hemophilia other opportunities uh, for actually competing uh, on the longer term, but right now it's not based on gene therapy. Let, let me ask about the possibility of M&A. Do you think that you need to pursue acquisitions in order to grow? No. I think we have a strong uh, portfolio of products in the market. We have a strong pipeline, so we can continue our organic growth. In the biofarm space, we are short-term 
uh, in a situation where we'll see sales decline because of competitive products. We actually did announce yesterday a small acquisition in the biofarm space where we are getting in a, a product that can help diagnose growth hormone deficiency in adult patients. And this is a market we're focusing on. So we think that's a, a strong addition to our uh, portfolio. But we'll continuously be looking at what are some of you know, the smaller bold on opportunities we can add to our biofarm business to get that faster back to growth. But Munoz is a growth story also based on our organic uh, initiatives.